basi moja kwa moja kutoka kaunti ya Nakuru. Kutoka hapa basi tungependa kuendelea lakini naarifiwa kwamba kwa hivi sasa hukumu ya kesi ya mauaji dhidi ya Joseph Irungu maarufu kama Joey inatolewa uh, kwa hivi sasa katika mahakama kuu ya Milimani. Hivyo basi itabidi tukatize mahojiano yetu hapa moja kwa moja tukupeleke katika mahakama hiyo ili kuweza kupata kujua kinachoendelea. Naitwa Mwana Hamisi Hamadi. Asante sana kwa muda wako uliotumia kutizama jukwaa la afya hadi wakati mwingine kwa heri. The court this morning. In the judgment before this court, which I am not going to read in details, but I'm sure the counsels will have the benefit of this judgment before end of day. I have discussed what sentencing is all about in about three paragraphs. And my conclusion thereof is that it is the final decision of the court on the sanction which an accused person has to suffer for his acts and or omission that constitutes an offense. That you'll find discussed in one of the journals in the New Zealand, which I've quoted, the Canadian, not New Zealand, Canada, the Canadian Sentencing Commission of 1987, which simply says that is a legal sanction to be imposed on a person found guilty of an offense. A writer by the name of Rabindra Baratani says that sentencing is a judgment of the court of law under legitimate jurisdiction where formal declaration of legal consequences of acts or omissions of an accused person is pronounced. It is a stage at which an accused person has been committed, convicted bears the legal consequences of his action. I want to draw us much more closer home in relation to the same, and you may want to look at clause 1.1.1 or our sentencing guidelines of 2023 that says that sentencing is a process by which a court imposes penal sanctions once an accused person has pleaded guilty and has been convicted. I thought it's important to put the exercise of the course sitting today in perspective by understanding that it's the last stage of the criminal trial. The other issue I want to speak to is the importance of this particular process. Most of the time, it is an understanding that our criminal justice system starts with reading out of the charge, taking a plea on the same, trial where there's a plea of not guilty, findings of the court as to whether an accused person is guilty or not guilty, and then that's it. And very little importance is attached to the process of sentencing. And we may want to understand that is a central task in the administration of justice, and in that regard may I refer you to clause 4.61 of the guidelines that I've just spoken to that says that it is a central and an important process. And we'll be finding out why it's important and why it's central to the criminal justice system. In addition to the clause I've given you, may I also refer you to the case of the Attorney General versus Susan Kiguta is a constitutional appeal number three of 2006, and just to put the point I am but tracing in perspective, let me just read two lines of what the court said in that matter. It said that a trial does not stop at convicting a person. The process of sentencing a person is part of the trial. This is because, and I want to lay emphasis on what I'm just about to read, because I think that is what this court was required to do, and we will be interrogating as to whether that was done. That it is a process of sentencing and is part of the trial because, one, the court will take into account the evidence. So there is also an understanding that at the stage of sentencing, the court shuts itself to the evidence that was adduced. That is not the correct position. And so one of the factors that this court has to take into consideration is the evidence that was adduced at the trial. 
and the basis for conviction. The other aspect and factor that the court will take into account that makes this stage to be a critical stage of the trial is the nature of the offense. So the court will have to go back and look at what is the offense that the accused person is charged with. And again, in addition, the court will have to take into account the circumstance of the case. And each case is treated on its own unique circumstances. Why are these factors important? Because at the end of the day, the question that the court must ask and answer is whether the sentence that this court will meet out in this matter today is the appropriate sentence, and more so, whether it meets the interest of justice. Please have a further reading. In the case of Anton Paraido versus the State of Mahindra is an Indian case and it speaks again to the importance of the process we are in today. And it says that sentencing is an important task in the matter of crime. And again, the reasoning for that is that at the end of the day, the court has to decide an appropriate, adequate, just, proportionate sentence that is commensurate to the offense an accused person has been charged with and convicted of. Having then looked at what sentence is and the importance thereof, let me get now back home. The case of Muratetu, we are all very familiar with the case of Muratetu. The case of Muratetu appreciates under paragraph 41 of the judgment of the Supreme Court that this is an important stage of trial. And they just use the same words and say at paragraph 41, it is evident that the trial process does not stop at convicting the accused. And the court said this, there's no doubt in our minds that sentencing is a crucial component of a trial. It therefore follows that once the court has arrived at a verdict of guilty, convicted, then the door to sentencing opens. And there are two questions that the court then will have to deal with. And the first question is, what would be the reasonable corresponding punishment for the offense? What would be the reasonable corresponding punishment for the offense? And two, whether that sentence, after it's been pronounced, was fair, appropriate enough to serve the interest of justice. In the course of the trial on sentence, general principles that guide sentencing have evolved. And I'll speak to them very briefly and make them as simple as I can. And I am laying this background because it will have a bearing on the final decision of this court in this matter. So that you have a deeper understanding where the court was operating from to arrive at the sentence that will eventually be pronounced in this matter. So the recognized principles of sentencing includes one, minimum intervention. What does it mean? It means that an accused person, a convicted person, must benefit from the least, the less severe minimum sentence. The second principle, and for the lawyers, you'll find this expounded in depth. I'm simply picking up the summary thereof. So before I go to the second principle, May I draw attention to the fact that this principle of minimum intervention is amplified and recognized in our Constitution, and I draw your attention to Article 50 of the Constitution of Kenya that says that an accused person should be given the benefit of the least severe sentence, and especially if there has been change in law in relation to that sentence between the time that accused person was charged and at the time the court is pronouncing its 
sentence. The second principle that we speak to is the principle of equality before the law. And what that principle speaks to is also reflected in our Constitution. And I want to draw your attention to Article 27, that in pronouncing a sentence, in meeting out a sentence against an accused person, it should not be based on any of the factors stipulated under that section, which includes race, sex, color, religion, that would prejudice that accused person. I speak to these things to bring to your knowledge that these are matters the court is led to and matters the court has considered in meeting out the sentence herein. The third principle is on proportionality. And this principle on proportionality speaks to two areas. That in deciding what is the appropriate proportional sentence to give, the court will take into account the aggravating and the mitigating factors. And so I am quite live to the fact that it will be important for the court to consider what are the aggravating factors and what are the mitigating factors. I'll be speaking to these principles later as I apply them to the matter before this court. The next principle speaks to imprisonment as the last resort. And this principle has evolved because according to what is said to be research, it does appear that imprisonment does not even deter commission of an offense. That is the argument for those who have advanced this principle and that the imprisonment should be the last resort. The other principle speaks to cost effectiveness. That before the court pronounces a sentence, it should stop and ask, what is the cost of, for example, if I may come back home, sentencing a person to prison, what is the economic impact to the society? And in fact, the argument behind this is that if the court finds the prisons are congested, then they might as well defer the sentence and wait for the congestion. I'm speaking to the principles that are generally, globally applicable in terms of sentencing. Let's come back home. What are the guidelines speaking to? So the sentencing guidelines at close 1.2 guides the court to take into account the following areas in determining sentence, and the first factor is proportionality. And it says that the sentence meted out should and must be proportionate to the offending behavior, meaning that it must not be more or less in view of the gravity of the offense. The other principle or guideline under the sentencing guideline is equality, uniformity, parity, consistency, and impartiality. And I am sure even if one just picked one, uh, that is consistency, that there should be consistency in the sentences that are meted out in relation to same or similar offenses. The sentence should speak to the principles and guidelines of accountability and transparency. The court should be able to give reasons why it has meted out the sentence that it has meted out. The other principle and guideline is inclusiveness. And this is very important. It requires the court to hear both the offender and the victim before pronounces its sentence. There is need to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms of the parties that are involved. And in this case, of course, the accused person. And finally, the sentencing guidelines requires this court to take cognizance of the need to enhance 
compliance with the domestic laws and international instrument, and we are all aware that Article 2, sub-Article 5 and 6 of our Constitution requires that the court takes into account all the treaties and conventions that have been ratified that form part and parcel of the law of this country. So those are factors this court needs to address in deciding the sentence in that in this matter. So by what then are the objectives of punishment? And again, I seek of your attention because this is very important. The generally accepted goals and objectives of punishment include but are not limited to retribution. And that entails the punishing of the offender for the conduct and that punishment be meted out in a just manner. The second objective of sentencing is deterrence. And I'm looking at deterrence in two categories, and that is basically the position. There is individual deterrence and there is general deterrence. And individual deterrence is where the offender is being deterred from committing a similar offense in the future, and the general deterrence targets the public that any other person who intends to commit a similar offense should be deterred. Again, very critical. I'll be speaking to the same as I revert back to this matter. The third objective and goal of sentencing is rehabilitation. I think the word speaks for itself. Whereby the sentence aims at giving the offender, the convict, an opportunity to be rehabilitated through designated, designed, programs with a view that the offender can reform and be reintegrated back into the society. I'll combine the other two objectives together, and that is resti restorative and restitution. Those two objectives speak to the offender remedying the wrong in form of compensation, and that would take an order where the court, for example, orders that you have caused harm, and so you need to re instead restitute to bring back the victim to the position that victim was before the offense was committed. I am speaking to all these objectives because we shall be interrogating them and finding out which one is suitable in this given matter. The other goal that we need to address is community protection. And the question the court must ask is this, does the sentence that has been meted out protect the community from the offender? Denunciation. Does the sentence clearly communicate the community's condemnation of the offense? Reconciliation. Should the court order reconciliation? where the family of the victim and the family of the offender sit together and reconcile. And finally, reintegration. Is the sentence of reintegration appropriate whereby you allow the accused person to go back and be reintegrated? And so, how does the court in the process of this trial deal with the issues, the goals, the principles. Section 216 and 239 of the civil, sorry, the criminal procedure court requires this court to conduct a trial and is in form of receiving evidence at this stage. It says as follows, that is section 216 and 329, the court, before passing a sentence or making an order against an accused person under Section 215, receives such evidence. It thinks fit to inform itself as to the sentence or the order to be passed or made.
In addressing section 216 and 326 that I've just spoken to, the Supreme Court in Muratetu case had this to say at paragraph 43. So it said that therefore from the reading of these sections, it is without doubt that the court ought to take into account the evidence, the nature of the offense, and the circumstances in order to arrive at an appropriate sentence. And in compliance, therefore, this court directed the parties to file their submissions. And as I indicated last time, the court had the opportunity to receive, to read, and to consider the submissions by the prosecution, the victim's family, and finally, mitigation by the accused person. For the benefit of all of us, I will, in a nutshell, summarize what the prosecution have invited this court to take into account before meeting out the sentence. Again, very briefly. The prosecution submissions are dated 6th of March, 2024. Before those submissions, the court had sought for the records of the accused person. The court received the records and the accused person is indeed a first offender. That fact has been considered in this decision. My understanding of the submissions by the prosecution are that they have invited this court to look at the aggravating factors in this matter. And they have outlined them as follows, and I'll read them out. The prosecution invites this court to note that on 20th day of September 2018, the deceased Monica Nyaweda Kimani lifeless body was found inside a bathtub with her throat brutally slit and hands tied. The court is invited to note that the post-mortem report produced by Dr. Peter Ndegwa confirmed that the deceased Monica Nyaweda Kimani died due to severe neck injuries due to a sharp force. The court is being invited to consider that there was serious and grievous harm occasioned to the deceased. The court has been invited to consider that the weapon used was a dangerous weapon and that the offense was an intricate planning. There was intricate planning of the offense. And in capital letters, the court has been invited to note that there was no degree of provocation from the deceased person towards the offender. And finally, the court has been invited to note that after commission of the offense, there was an attempt to conceal the evidence. Not finally, there's one more. The court has been invited to consider that the crime had serious uh, physiological and physical harm to the victim and the family. Based on these factors, the prosecution argues that this court should meet out the sentence as provided for under the law. They have invited this court to note that despite the decision in the case of Muratetu, the only thing that that case did was to declare, and I will put it clearly, that the mandatory, and I will repeat, the mandatory nature of the death sentence is unconstitutional and that he did not declare the death sentence unconstitutional. And so without going into other areas of submissions which are reflected in my judgment hearing, the prosecution invited this court to pronounce a death sentence. 
The victim's family, in their submissions dated 7th of March, drew the court's attention to the sentence provided for the offense of murder, which sentence is stipulated under section 204, which says that a person convicted of the offense of murder shall suffer death. They led the court through the objectives of sentence, which I've spoken to, and therefore I'll not repeat. And they invited the court to take cognizance of the fact that the accused person before the court did not play a peripheral role in the commission of the offense, but he was the main perpetrator of the offense. In that, they are saying that he did not only steal an ID card of a third party, but used it to disguise his identity, changed his clothes and went to the deceased house and brutally murdered her. They described the murder, murder as being cold-blooded, ghastly, and barbaric. They have invited this court to consider that no amount of monetary compensation can ever bring the deceased back. And they have invited this court to note that the death of the deceased occasioned the family a lot of economic loss as the business of the family that she was manning in South Sudan collapsed and that it was the only means of income for the family. Finally, the accused person filed their submissions in form of mitigation dated 10th of March. And I think it's important I take a bit of time in our understanding of what the accused person said because he is the one on trial. So I will not summarize too much his mitigation and also for the parties to appreciate that I've taken it into consideration in totality. The accused says that he's aware that nothing he says at this stage will relieve the pain of the deceased family. And he says, the lesser he says, the better. He says that he expresses his sadness that such a tragic loss of life on extreme circumstances bordering, and this caught my attention, okay? <clears throat> he says that he expresses his sadness that such a tragic and callous loss of life on extremely circumstances bordering on an act of absolute madness that is beyond understanding, even to him, as he stands there convicted. He says that it is his prayer that the deceased family will find peace and that her soul will rest in internal peace. He says that he understands the terrible fear and pain that the deceased must have underwent in the hands of the perpetrator and he cannot even perceive the same. He joins the victim's family by saying that he does appreciate that monetary compensation cannot relieve the pain of the loss of our loved one. The court has been invited by the accused person to note that by the Supreme Court declaring the mandatory nature of death sentence to be unconstitutional, unconstitutional, then it opened room and gave this court the discretion to meet out 
a sentence that is not necessarily death. And the accused then says that in that case, and again, this was very important to the court and for reading, because I come back to it. He says that in that case, it is his prayer that the court can meet out a custodial sentence. He says that although the victim's family in their submissions are calling for a death sentence, but the father of the victim, Bishop Paul Garama, was publicly heard saying that he will not take vengeance. And so, the court should consider his views. Finally, the accused person invited the court to consider that he is a first offender, that he was convicted purely on circumstantial evidence, and the period he has spent in custody. That, in my considered opinion, was the additional evidence given to this court in form of submissions by the parties at the cross of the formal trial. In looking at the goals of punishment and in considering the objectives, I made reference to inclusivity. And I said that before a sentence is meted out, the views of the victim and the community are extremely important. And so at this stage, I want to speak to the pre-sentence report that this court was given. Now, um, I must thank the probation department because they gave me an extremely detailed pre-sentence <coughs> report. What comes out of that report is this, that the accused person before this court is 33 years old. His parents are alive. He has three siblings who, from the report, are also alive. It speaks to their permanent place of abode at Guta Estate, which is just adjacent to Net military barracks within Nakuru County. It indicates that this accused person completed his secondary school education in the year 2010. He then joined the Kenya Polytechnic and completed his training in the year 2011, where he qualified by being conferred with a diploma in food production. The report says that thereafter, and again, this was critical for this court, he moved to Dubai where he received training in tactical military at Dubai Police Academy and by a group known as Ogara Group, which he says that Ogara Group is a security firm with presence in Dubai, United Kingdom, and several European countries. And eventually, after that training, he was licensed to offer private security. The report indicates that at the time he was arrested, he was providing security in Kenya mostly to persons in political sector, and he was at an advanced stage of registering his own security firm. Outside his training and daily work, the report indicates that he's a staunch Christian. He has sung, produced several uh, music videos, and um, he was actively involved in church activities. It is further indicated that when this offense was committed, 
He was in a relationship with one Jacqueline Maribe, who was his co-accused, and they were planning to formalize their relationship. At the time of the offense, they were both residing at Royal Park Estate in Langata, and they had resided together for over one year. Medical condition, the report indicates that he suffers from asthma since childhood, and that is usually triggered by colds and dust, but is on medication. It is indicated that he has developed now problems, and that arose out of a gun incident, which we spoke to in the judgment and in this matter. But it said that the same is treated by painkillers, which gives him relief. On the offense, the report says that the accused person maintains his innocence and that he was shocked and depressed to be linked with the murder of the deceased. That he denies knowing the deceased, but acknowledges that he knows his brother. And it says that he grieves for the family of the deceased for losing her in a gruesome manner. The report indicates that he has good relationship with his family. The sister has stood by him throughout the trial. They describe him, that is his family, and again this is important, as a social, overly generous, respectful to authority, committed Christian, and he believes in innocence, although he has, he believes in his innocence, although he has painfully accepted the conviction. The family of the accused says that they have been stigmatized. First, a lot of stigmatization and financial drain in form of legal costs. They are expressing empathy for the family of the deceased and pray that the perpetrators will be found. And finally, they pray for leniency in sentence. From the community point of view, the probation officer interviewed a senior chief of free area location, Dr. Samuel Macharia, who described the accused person as being well-mannered, respectful, and was not a threat to the community. That the community is shocked by the charge that was preferred against him and subsequent conviction. That they vouch for his good character, social standing, as they have known him to be a respectable youth committed to church activities. Bishop Shadrach Olo of Agape Sanctuary Church says that the accused person is a member of his church. He is steadfast in faith, relates well with fellow Christians, and at the time of his arrest, he was a choir master in the church. He pleaded for leniency. The investigating officer, Mr. Maxwell Otieno, is indicated in the report as having described the accused person as an extremely dangerous person, violent in nature, as demonstrated by the fact that he was involved in an assault case with one Rogers at Club 1824 when he was out on bond in this matter. And that the reason why the case did not go forward is because the complainant withdrew the complaint and the investigating officer called for the maximum sentence provided for under the law. The community from where the victim hails from in Fika described the victim as a person who had a promising future, they were shocked at her death, and they called for a stringent sentence. 
the family of the victim. The family of the victim are reported in the pre-sentence report to have stated that following the demise of the victim, the death occasioned them monumental psychological impact and they are still to cope with the said offense and death. And other than the father of the deceased who has received psychological counseling, none of the other family members have had the benefit of the same. It is indicated that at the time the probation officer was interviewing the mother of the victim, she broke down severely and wailed, forcing him to stop the interview to allow her to calm down. She is said to have indicated that she does not understand what would cause anyone to brutally murder her only daughter who was her confidant and her very close friend. It is reported that following the death of the victim and the deceased, she suffered prolonged depression and consequently suffered stroke. According to her, the inappropriate sentence is death. The father of the deceased is reported to have indicated that the extensive media coverage impeded their emotional healing. The younger brother of the victim is reported to have ceased watching news, <coughs> stopped trusting people, limits his movement, avoids going to public places, and only does online jobs. It is reported following the death of the deceased, as already indicated in the submissions of the victim, having been the managing director of the family business in South Sudan, the business collapsed, the family became drained financially, and they were not able to meet their day-to-day -day needs as that was the main source of their income. In a nutshell, the family of the deceased hold the view that the maximum sentence provided under the law should be pronounced and they acknowledge that whatever the case is, even that particular sentence will not console them or erase their pain. Finally, the probation officer, and again, this is very important, and the court took note of the same. The probation officer, Mr. Andrew Kanyotu, in conclusion and his own observation, states as follows. He describes the accused criminogenic risk factors as follows. That he lacks stable partner relationships. He has antisocial personality patterns manifested by living on the edge. He is impulsive and a thrill seeker. He, use, he uses anger or aggression to control others. And finally he says that the accused has a double personality trait. What is the recommendation in the pre-sentence report? 
he recommends that the court uses his own discretion in meeting out the sentence, taking into account what is in the report and the sentiments of both the accused and the offender. So that's a summary of the submissions by the prosecution, the victim's family, and the accused. So what sentence then would this court be looking at? First and foremost, let's acknowledge where our sentences are provided for. Section 24 of the Penal Code recognizes the following forms of sentences. One, a death sentence. Two, life imprisonment. Or an imprisonment for a term of years. Detention under the Detention Camp Act, if that were the offense committed under that act. And it's important to interrogate these types of punishments because then one needs to do an exercise of elimination inclusive and justify why this would not be applicable. And so I speak to them for our understanding. Fine, forfeiture, payment of compensation, finding security to keep peace and be of good behavior, and any other punishment this court will find and deem appropriate. So this court cannot give a sentence outside those various recognized forms of punishment. When I considered these categories and types of punishments, I classified them into two, custodial and non-custodial. So again, the question is, having taken into account the evidence as was adduced in this court, taking into account the submissions at this stage of trial, is this an appropriate case for a non-custodial sentence? I'll deal with that. We have already spoken to the fact that a sentence must have a purpose. And so what purpose would a non-custodial sentence serve? One of the goals that a non-custodial sentence would serve is to give an accused person an opportunity for rehabilitation. And so, is this accused person eligible for rehabilitation? My answer was in the negative. For simple reason that a person who is given a, an opportunity for rehabilitation must first and foremost himself acknowledge commission of the offense and the need to reform. Without that attitude, there will be no need to consider rehabilitation. It will not work. He will not appreciate, and of course, then it will be an order in vain. Alongside rehabilitation, we have the goal of reintegration. And when one is considering reintegration, then several questions must be answered. We are releasing this person to the society. Is that safe? Is the society safe? We'll answer that question. What about restitution, restor restoration? I've already spoken to this and said this is a situation where you are telling the accused person, make good the harm. Is this a case where an accused person can make good the harm in the form of monetary compensation? As I was dealing with this particular goal, my mind took me to a case I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm dealing with appeals and more so in civil cases. 
and someone has come before the court because they were involved in an accident and they suffered bodily injuries. And in the case of Coastal Kenya Enterprise Limited versus Mushiri, is a civil appeal number 84 of 2016. This is what the court said, and which I fully associate with. Money cannot renew a physical frame that has been battered and shattered. And so in my considered opinion, this is not an appropriate case where the sentence that is being meted out is aimed at restitution, restoration, and or compensation in monetary terms. What about reconciliation? Should this court give a sentence that would aim at reconciling the two families? Having listened to me read out the pre-sentence report, it is very clear that these two families are incapable of sitting to negotiate to reconcile. Where does that leave the court? The court was left with only two objectives to look at, retribution and deterrence. And I've already spoken to them at the beginning of this judgment. That is where the court punishes the offender. At the same time, deters the offender from repeating the offense if given an opportunity, and the general public from committing a similar offense. The purpose of law and the aim of law, in my understanding, is to maintain law and order and protect the citizens of a particular state. That is why one of the objectives of sentencing is community protection. And therefore the sentence any court pronounces must speak clearly to the community condemnation of criminal conduct. At this point, I was drawn, and I'm entitled as a court, to take judicial notice as I talk about and discuss general deterrence. To take judicial notice of the social justice concept. And that concept, in my understanding, speaks to the court being live to the happenings in the society at a given time. And my mind, as a court, my understanding, my reading, is that in recent past, there have been numerous reports of senseless murders targeting persons of female gender. Let this not just be my words from where I sit, in an article dated the 26th January 2024, Amnesty International Kenya noted that a woman is killed in this country in every two days. And I will quote from the article so that I attribute it to where it belongs. Let me read the caption from that article. Amnesty International Kenya strongly condemns the profiling, torture, and killing of women and any other individual based on their identity. Over 10 cases of femicide have been reported across the country since 1st of January 2024. That is, every second day, a woman has been brutalized and killed because of her identity. According to statistics from Africa Data Hub, between 2016 and 2023, over 500 women have been killed. The majority of those murdered were below the age of 35 years and were killed by intimate partners or people known to them. 
according to the Africa Data Hub, a regional network of data organization that traces such killing based on newspaper reports. It states that about 500 women have been killed in Kenya from January 2016 to 2023. And let me draw ourselves back home. In an article published by the Daily Nation on 27th of January 2024, it indicates that 16 women have been killed since January 2024. The most disturbing was a case of Rita Mweni, a 20-year-old student at Njomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology was lured to a short accommodation apartment at Roy Sambo, common known as Airbnb. She was murdered, her body was dismembered, her head was dumped at a different location, and one can only but consider the words said by Dr. Jansen Odwal, the pathologist, and these were his words. He said, this is the first time I've come across such an incident in my forensic life. I have never come across such an incident. And so when we are considering the public's denunciation of a crime, one cannot live outside the prevailing circumstance in the society. It is the understanding of this court that this report speak to a situation whereby the social fabric of the society has been torn into two, right at the middle. And the court must then leave to its role to protect the society. And so, Having ruled out a non custodial sentence, and may I just say this, the accused person is also not even asking for a non custodial sentence. I read the submissions on mitigation, and in their own writing, they tell this court, Muratetu did not declare a death sentence to be mandatory but then the court can give a custodial sentence. They say a custodial. There is nowhere in that report where this court is being invited to consider a non-custodial sentence. So we are at a stage of a custodial sentence. And I've already made reference to the sentences that this court can pronounce under section 24. First track the judgment. The following factors have been considered by this court as I come to the tail end of the judgment. And there are only three sentences that are open to the court. A sentence for a term of years, life imprisonment, or death. The question that we all must ask is this, how many years and what would be the basis for those years? Secondly, and for the lawyers before me, and today I am well populated, thank you for coming. We are all aware of the jurisprudence on life Imprisonment, where one of the courts has said it is unconstitutional. The latest decision which I've quoted in this matter says that life imprisonment is 30 years. So the question that one would then ask is, if life imprisonment, and of course is acceptable, it doesn't mean the life which that person will physically live or be alive. So if we start years and with remission, then we'll be looking at where this court is sentencing the accused person to 30 years. With remission, he serves 20 years and his life 
moves on. These are issues the court had to think of. I have, of course, taken into account issues of human rights. I have taken into account Section 26, sorry, Article 26, that says a person's life should not just be deprived without good reason. I have made reference, and maybe I should then let you know, to the international instruments that speak, and I need to do this because it's important, <coughs> to the preservation and the right to enhance an individual's human rights. The International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which has been ratified and which then, of course, becomes part of our law under Article 2, sub Article 5 and 6, says this, and it's important that I read it out because you need to know that. It starts by saying every human being has the right to life. And I stop there and I tell myself as a quote, Every human being has a right to life, that every human being includes the victim and the offender. It then says this. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. Most of the time when we read these provisions, we speak to them as they relate to the offender. My understanding is they relate to both the offender and the victim. That convention states as follows. That in countries that have not abolished the death penalty, death a sentence of death may be imposed only for the most serious crimes in accordance with the law in force at the time of the commission of the crime. So these international instruments that speak to human rights do recognize that there are exceptional circumstances when the death sentence may be inevitable. Let's look at Article 4 of the Africa Chart on Human Rights, on Human and People's Rights, ratified on 23rd of January 1992. It provides that human beings are invaluable. Every human being shall be entitled to respect for his life. His, in my considered opinion, includes her life. And the integrity of his or her person. Again, it reiterates no one may be arbitrarily deprived of this right. Muratetu reflected again. The Supreme Court says that you can indeed impose a death sentence for most serious offenses, extremely grave. So the question is, is this a case of serious crime? In answering that question, I considered the following. What the evidence said And the first thing that was revealed by the evidence is the manner in which the offense was committed. I want to remind ourselves of the judgment I delivered on 9th of February, where I indicated clearly that the evidence of the doctor who conducted the post-mortem report 
indicated that the person who perpetrated this offense cut the throat of the deceased through and through. In that judgment, I spoke to an understanding that the person was not an amateur. The person must have had some training. And remember the evidence even revealed that after the offense was committed, the deceased was put in the bathtub and the shower um, tub was put over to run the blood off. When I read the report presented by the probation department, where the accused person himself says, I have been trained by the Dubai Police Academy and an Ogara group. I thought that corroborated the finding of this court that there was full scale for commission of the offense. I do recall saying in that judgment that the manner in which the offense was committed did not at any time intend to give the deceased one more minute to live. I do recall throughout the trial, no any other than the counsel representing the accused person in this trial, throughout, kept on referring to the incident and the scene of crime as a slaughterhouse. Secondly, we have had the benefit of looking at the photographs showing the body of the deceased and the injuries. I would certainly not display them there, certainly not, at least for the benefit of the family. And I did indicate in my judgment, no one would like to look at them again, not once, not twice. Now, let's look at, and this is very critical, because it is not the court just making an observation, it was a brutal murder. Let's look at how the defense, on that is the submissions, in mitigation by the accused person himself describes the offense. I will now read to you how they describe the offense. Verbatimly. They say that it is a tragic, cardiac loss of life on extreme circumstances bordering on an act of absolute madness that is beyond understanding. So even the defense joins the victim's family and the prosecution and the court in arriving at the conclusion it was a gruesome murder. Horrific, frightening. Let's now look at another important aspect that the court has considered. The consequences of the offense. From where I sit as a court, each one of us is responsible for the natural and the probable consequences of our actions and or omission. So it's not just an issue of committing an offense, but the far-reaching consequences of that offense cannot be ignored. And so in this case, it is undisputed that the deceased was the managing director of the family's business in South Sudan. It is undisputed that the business collapsed after her demise. It is undisputed that that was the source of income for the family and we can all appreciate the natural and probable consequences of that. I have already made reference to the fact that the other consequence of this offense is what has been described, and unless there is evidence to the contrary, 
I believe did because it's in the probation officer's report that the mother of the deceased suffered depression and stroke and she has hardly healed. I've spoken to what the brother is said to be undergoing. This court, and I never lose out on anything, I try to get as much of in-depth of the material before me as I can, has been invited to take cognizance of the fact that the father of the deceased at one time said, I will let go. Uh, that did not form part of my record because what formed part of the court's record is his sentiments as expressed in the prevailed report. And that is what I would safely go by. But I'll be concluding with a few, one or two other findings that could probably remove us from that mind thought that the father said, do not, vengeance is not mine. I also want us to just, in concluding, other than looking at the manner in which the offense was committed and the consequence of the impact of the offense, I took a bit of time to look at the character of the accused person. I have already spoken to how the probation officer describes him, aggressive and social personality and conclusive as double personality trained. But let's look at what else this court was able to gather while hearing this matter on the character of the accused person. It was the evidence of the guards at Royal Park Estate where he was staying that he would not allow himself to be searched. He would brandish a gun and say, I work at State House and just drive off. It is the evidence of the brother of the deceased that even during the hearing of this case, at one time, he blocked his car when the case was going on. And of course you have heard from the I.O. even when he was out on board, he was still involved. I'm not condemning him because there's no charge before me. But the court cannot avoid looking at this. Because at the end of the day, the question is this. Is this a person you want to release back to the society? And these issues become extremely critical for consideration. Finally, this matter and the evidence adduced does not lead to a conclusion that this murder was accidental. that the perpetrator did not have an opportunity to think about the consequences of his action. It was intentional. It was not a defensive act. It was not out of provocation. It was planned. It was intended. And it was executed. In, and those who do not subscribe to Christian faith, bear with me. I do. And that's the only place I could make reference to. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, this is what is written. I think I looked at the was it NIV? You can find out. It speaks to the same thing. This is what the Lord said to Satan. 
Behold, all that he has is yours. Only do not lay a hand on his person. I will repeat. Behold, all that he has is yours and is in your power. Only do not lay your hand on his person. The provision of life is the preserve of God. And I find no room anywhere for a person to take another person's life unlawfully. In my very final conclusion, join me in listening to these wise sayings on murder. One, in the act of murder, one person's life ends, but countless number of lives are forever impacted. I will read again. In an act of murder, one life, one person's life ends, but a countless number of lives are forever impacted. Secondly, mother leaves behind a trail of shattered dreams and broken hearts that can never be healed. Mother leaves behind a trail of shattered dreams and broken hearts that can never be healed. I have said the accused person before me is 33 years. The deceased was 28 years. Thirdly, the act of murder is a heinous crime that challenges the moral fabric of society and demands justice. And so it is not just a loss to the immediate family. Of course it is in the highest degree, but is a loss to the society when one is killed unlawfully. And so, based on everything I have said, I have ordered that the first accused person before this court being Joseph Kuria Irungu Alas Joey shall suffer death as provided for the offense of murder under section 204 of the Penal Code of Kenya. And is that sentence is lawfully set aside by a court of competent jurisdiction. That is the order of the court. Thank you. Yes, Council. Yes, my lady. Um, for purposes of appeal, um, uh, the prayers we provided with uh, uh, copies of uh, 
copy of the judgments and uh, sentencing decision and uh, judge decisions. Any other council wish to address the court? Yes, my lady, uh, on behalf of the victim's family, we would also wish to thank the court for sincerely the manner in which the court has handled the proceedings. Uh, the family feels that justice has been done. We also wish that the court supplies us with the court of the sentence and judgment to find the same Uh, a right of appeal is a constitutional right which the accused person should feel free to exercise is important. Uh, you are entitled to the proceedings, the judgment uh, that the court will deliver on today's judgment. And when the file was brought to me, and I'm sure by now my judgment, I, it was actually available the same day I delivered before seven. So just ask the Honorable DR to give you the proceedings and the judgment. Uh, I've always said that my judgment is never accessible until I've delivered. My judgment on sentence is here. As I was delivering, I could see quite a bit of typo. So it's just an issue of polishing it. You should have a copy. I'll sign a copy before end of day, and you should have a copy. Okay? So unless there is any other person who is addressing the court, may I have the last bite of the cherry? First and foremost, please allow me to sincerely thank all of you, and that means the parties in the matter, the members of the public, the press, uh, for the support you have given this court. I took over this matter from my brother, Justice uh, Wakiaga, and uh, as much as I know there has been a bit of complaint that he's taken long, we did the best we could. Uh, we lost a bit of time during COVID when activities of the court slowed down. But take it from me. When you look at the way this mattered, I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I have no reason to. But one thing we must appreciate that this matter was being had alongside other matters. And let me say something that probably you wouldn't know. When I was presiding in the criminal division of the High Court here in Nairobi before I was transferred, I did a prison visit at the Nairobi remand, and those inmates took me on on this matter. And their question was, Panino na kimbiza kesi ya Joey na Maribe na walituacha hapa na wendeshi kesi yetu haraka. I didn't realize that we were moving fast with this matter. So for the members of the public who have felt that when we talk about only six years, it's also important to consider that uh, there are other matters. And so please, we are not making an excuse for anything, but it's good to just make an understanding and of course uh, apologize for any inconvenience that may have been caused by any delay in the hearing of this matter, but set the record clear, we did the best we could. And so I thank you for your support because other than the time we had a bit of challenge when I think Professor Nandwa had a personal issue, all the time the lawyers were in court and we were able to move on. I have not had a disruption in this matter. The press, I must really congratulate you. I have not had to summon you here to say, what did you report? 
except recently, which I will not talk to, but maybe I should. When I was reported to have said something which was said when I was still driving to this place and I was still on my way here. And I'm said, reported to have said that the accused person, Jacqueline Maribe, must come to court even when she's sick. I don't know, where, was it KTN or what other uh, media house reported? Siku jua hiyo ametoa wapi, lakini musijali hiyo imeisha, eh? Elisha hivyo tu, you know you must also choose the battles to fight, eh? But what I'm saying is that generally speaking, I really want to thank you. I know you are quite a number of you, and you are understanding, but I've not had any reason to complain that you have not reported these matters factually correct. So thank you very much. Please keep up the good job you're doing. For the rest of us, thank you for coming, um, supporting the judiciary as it were. Your patience with us is highly appreciated. And with that, I wish you a good day for the rest of the day. Um, for our staff, uh, the court assistant, and of course, my other good friends, I can even see one whom I worked with for a long time, the gentleman there. Mefanya kazi miakangapi? Over 10, eh? Please don't say anything more, they'll start guessing my age. Okay. So thank you very much, court assistant. Unless we have any other matters that are before the court, I would request then we officially adjourn the court. Na mtazamaji hiyo ni hukumu ambayo imesomwa hivi sasa na jaji Grace Nzioka kwani Joseph Irungu maarufu kama Joey kwa hivi sasa amehukumiwa kifo. Jaji Grace Nzioka amesema kwamba amempata uh, Joey na makosa na nastahili uh, kutangamana na jamii hiyo na kumhukumu kifo. Joey alipatikana na hatia kumuua mfanyabiashara Monica Kimani mwaka 2018 akisoma hukumu hiyo. Jaji Grace Nzioka amesema kwamba mahakama imezingatia masala yote aliyowasilishwa ikiwemo alivyomuua Monica na maombi ya familia ya Monica ikumbukwe kamba uh, Joey alikuwa ana ameshtakiwa pamoja na Jackie Maribe ambaye aliachiliwa huru na mahakama siku kadha zilizopita. Ni kesi ambayo imekuwa ikisubiriwa kwa hamu na hii leo jaji Grace Nzioka hatimaye ametoa hukumu ya kifo kwa Joey maarufu Joey ambaye amekuwa kihukumiwa katika kesi hiyo. Mtazamaji tutakufahamisha mengi katika taarifa zetu ambazo zinakuja kwa sasa. Uh, tutaweza tu kupata mengine kisha baadaye wanahabari wetu ambao wanafuatilia kesi hiyo watakuwa ni wenye kutueleza mengi tu kuhusiana na hayo. Naarifiwa kwamba mwanahabari wetu Ben Kirui yuko tayari na hivi sasa anaweza kutueleza kwa kina yale ambayo yamepita katika mahakama hiyo. Kirui kama una nipata naomba utueleze pengine katika kutoa au uamuzi huo jaji Nzioka alisema ni yapi mengine ambayo aliyazingatia kuweza kumpata Joey na hukumu hiyo Na mkirui kama unanipata tungependa kujua kutoka kwako umekuwa mahakamani kuanzia wakati ambapo hukumu hiyo ilikuwa inasomwa. Je, ni yapi mengine ambayo jaji Nzioka aliweza kuyazingatia kabla ya kupitisha hukumu hiyo?
Na wakati Kirui anaweza kujitayarisha ni kukufahamisha tu kwamba kesi hiyo ilikuwa inaendelea kuanzia mwaka nane baada ya habari kuibuka kwamba Monica Kimani alikuwa ameuawa na watuhumiwa katika kesi hiyo ambao walikuwa ni Jackie Maribe pamoja na Joey wakapatikana na hatia ambapo kumekuwa na ufuatilizi wa kesi hiyo ambapo hii leo jaji aliamua kutoa uamuzi wake wa kumpata na hatia ya mauaji Joey ambapo amemhukumu kifo. Uh, namba si tutakomea hapo kwa sasa iwapo tutampata mwanahabari wetu tutarejea ili tuweze kukufahamisha zaidi